morning, everybody. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Christian. And uh, as you fellow mask and glasses wearers, people know that sometimes you have uh, wardrobe malfunctions at the worst possible moment. And I could not get my mask off, and I could not see you until just now. But now that I can see you, uh, I am glad to, I doubt, be the first person, but to welcome y'all. Um, we have come to a God who is a consuming fire, who at the same time, without nuancing that at all, loves people. He loves sinners, he loves people who do not love him back, and he draws people like us to actually, like, despite ourselves, become people who not just confess that we do not have it all together, but we are willing and even open to confess we are not very good people. But that's okay, because the love of God doesn't go out looking for something that already pleases it. The love of God goes out and looks for something that doesn't please it, so that he can transform it into something he does. And I'm just looking around the room at men and women and children who have been transformed because God's love loves ugly, evil, wicked people. And I'm one of those people, and I'm, so I'm grateful, and it continues to blow my mind every time this happens. I get to read scripture to you, and I get to pray, and I get to preach God's word. I just, it doesn't make any sense humanly based on where I come from. It, it cannot be humanly explained, but it is a blessing for me to be one of the elders and so this morning, as we look at a, another difficult story from the book of Numbers, a story that, again, allows us to examine our hearts and let the Word of God x-ray it and see what comes out on the other side, what is shown by the power of His Word, we are people who can open up our chests to God and to His Word and not fear anything because God is kind and powerful towards sinners. And so before we even read this story in Numbers chapter 20, let's go to him. Let's ask for his help. Let's ask for him to manifest and show the kindness that we know he has in his heart toward us. Pray with me. Guide us, O oh, our great Redeemer, pilgrims through this barren land. We are weak, but you are mighty. Hold us with your powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed us now and evermore. Feed us now and evermore. Open now the crystal fountain where the healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead us all our journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, ever be our strength and shield, ever be our strength and shield. And when we tread the verge of Jordan, bid our anxious fears subside. Death of death and hell's destruction land us at one Savior, safe on Canaan's side, because songs of praises, songs of praises we will ever sing to you. We will ever sing to you if you open our hearts and, your, and our minds to your word. Do this powerfully, Jesus, through your spirit, to the glory of the Father, in your name. Amen. This morning we'll have a relatively short reading. It's only like 13 verses compared to the last couple of weeks. That's easy peasy, right? Uh, the story and the reading this morning is Numbers chapter 20. We'll start in verse 1, and we will stop at verse 13. And listen very carefully, because this is God's word. And the people of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh. And Miriam, Moses and Aaron's sister, who had been a leader of God's people from the moment they came out of Egypt, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have y'all, I'm going to intentionally say y'all because he's, the people switch not just to talking to Moses, but they're talking to Moses and Aaron at this point. Why have y'all brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have y'all made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grains or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the staff 
and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he commanded him. But then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels! Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I've given them. These are the waters of Meribah, which means quarreling, where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord. And through them, he showed himself holy. We're taking this opportunity through this period of Lent, these four weeks that we're celebrating in March, to ask ourselves some very honest questions. We asked two weeks ago, what do you want? To, last week we asked, what are you afraid of? And this week the question is really simply, what are you angry about? Last week we, we saw Paul in the New Testament reflecting back on the book of Numbers. and He told New Testament believers who have experienced things that Old Testament believers could only dream of, that these things in the Old Testament actually happened, but they were written down to teach us, to instruct us, And in 1 Corinthians 10, he says they were written down to teach us that we should watch ourselves lest we do the exact same stuff. Take heed lest we fall. But do you know in another place, in Romans chapter 15, the same guy, Paul, tells another group of Christians, these things were written down. Whatever was written in former days was written down for our instruction that through endurance... And through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And so we want to balance this as we read the the Old Testament as Bible-believing people, as people who like our Lord Jesus, love God's word. We want to balance on the one hand to read these stories knowing that we are no better than Israel and we could do far worse if God doesn't help us. And to read these stories and think we have got it so good I want to endure. I want to make it through. I have hope for what's coming. We want to read both of these stories with both of those hands held together. And we need endurance and we need encouragement as we follow Jesus, don't we? This, short, this story is showing us that we need, we need endurance, we need hope, because the fear and the danger of anger is real. I, I found a, a a group of statistics about, this was a National Health Institute uh, survey that was done on, on anger. I think, I don't, I don't even think I need to read any stats to point out anger is a problem in our world. Like we, we struggle with it and other people have a problem with anger. But listen to these stats. 32% of people say they have a close friend or a family member who has trouble containing their anger. That's a third of, a third of the people in this country, a third of us. I love this. 12% say they have trouble cont- containing their own anger. 32% say they know somebody who has trouble. Only 12% say they have trouble. So that means there's a 20% gap. 20% of people have anger problems and everyone else but them knows it. Listen to this stat. Of those 12% who own up and say, I have a, a hard time containing my anger, of those 12%, only 13% of them have sought help with their anger problem. So less than 1% overall have asked for help dealing with their anger. That's scary. 28% of people say they worry about how angry they feel sometimes. 27% of nurses have been attacked by an angry person at work. A patient that they're there to care for. In America, every nine seconds, a woman is assaulted or beaten. 
The, the numbers and the statistics are scary, and they should scare us into reading the story and thinking, this is not a story for other people. This is a story for me and for the people in my closest circle. And, and let me tell you, in my experience as a, as a normal human being, but also as a pastor who gets invited into situations like this all the time, in my experience, most people who are regularly angry, including me, I have an anger problem, all honesty out there, most people who are angry have to learn the hard way that we're even angry in the first place. We don't have anger problems. Other people are just jerks. Life is irritating to us. Stuff doesn't go fairly. I'm not angry, it's just the world is hard. That's how so many of us look at the world and don't look at our own hearts. And the problem of anger being a problem, it's not unique in our culture, it's not unique um, to any set of circumstances that we have to deal with in South Effingham today. It's a problem for normal Christians at all times and in all places. And what we see in this story is that anger is a problem for the, not just the like normal people like you and me, anger is a problem for the very best. The, God's appointed, divinely chosen leaders, right? We, we keep using this Bible word appropriately, these ones who are anointed with oil to publicly represent God to his people, prophets and priests and kings. The Bible word for that is with a little m, Messiah. If we were to translate it into Greek with a little c, little Christs, God's many messiahs and his many Christs, even they have huge anger problems. And that's really the obvious and the big idea of this story, if you and I do not check our sinful anger, then it will cost us our place in the promised land. If we don't check our sinful anger, this will affect us and the people we love most. I mean, really simply, what we see first is that anger easily leads to sin. I, I almost don't know that I need to explain much of that. I think we get anger slides right into bad behavior, bad thoughts, bad desires real quick. But let's see what the Bible says about it. Last week, I think we need to define our terms. Last week, we, we saw fear. I think we should define fear as our involuntary, our physical and mental response to what we love being threatened. I love my own body, so when the grizzly bear runs down me at the trail, I'm afraid. Fear slides into anxiety, which is sinful and difficult, and only Christ can deliver us from that. What is anger, then? I think we can define anger like this. Anger, very similarly, is our involuntary, physical, and emotional response to what we love being not threatened, but what we love being harmed. When I love something that is being hurt, whatever that looks like for me, whatever that looks like for you, that is anger. And for some of us, that's, I mean, it's involuntary. We, like, I had a conversation yesterday with someone. I realized they were telling me something, a story, that I was mad at the person they were telling the story about. And I noticed I was involuntarily clenching my fists. I was gritting my teeth. Not at them, but at what the story was about. And that's, like, uh, for some of us, we know, like, that's, like, the tamest version. That's, like, we wish our anger could be that good. Because our, our love for things and our love for people, when that gets harmed... Anger's not bad, but anger slides to sin real fast, doesn't it? It's when another child on the playground slaps our kid in the face. It's when somebody insults our very best friend. I love my child. I love my friends. And so when they are harmed, I experience anger. And so do you. Whatever, whatever you love, figure it out for yourself. What is it that you love that when it is harmed, you get angry? And it's not just the big things. It's not just the slap in the face or the insult. It's the little things. It's, uh, you know, again, for me, it took me a long time to realize how angry of a person I, I am. Um, I would never say, and maybe you're like me, I would never say I'm angry. I just get irritated sometimes. I get frustrated. Certain people and certain things really disappoint me. And like uh, the character of Dr. Gregory House on House MD, as he so rightly says, disappointment is anger for wimps. <laughs> Don't say you're disappointed. Be honest. You're angry. I get angry too. And anger, like every human emotion, is neither good nor bad. I want to set this up from the beginning. Anger is not inherently bad, and that's an important point for right now. Anger is either good nor bad, but it does reveal something really vital. If anger is what we experience involuntarily when what we love is being harmed, anger is an invitation to just ask ourselves, what do we really love? 
What is being harmed right now that I love so much that this is what's coming out? Anger and fear, all of these emotions that God has created us to have are, are really the best example I've ever heard is they're, they're like the check engine light in our cars. When the check engine light comes on, we don't get mad at the dashboard. Like, we don't, ha- we don't, we don't take our car to the shop if you're a kind of a dumb-dumb like me or if you're a smart guy and smart girl, you fix your own cars. If, if you, when that happens, you don't look at it and say, man, I gotta fix this dashboard. <laughs> this dashboard is out of whack. No, you take it in and say, hey, this light's come on, and I honestly don't even know what's going on, but something's up. I need to pop the hood and check out what's going on. Anger does not, anger is not a sin. Anger and fear and every human emotion invites us to pop the hood and see what's going on underneath that this warning light, this flashing thing is coming on. It's an invitation to ask ourselves to slow down, and with anger in particular, what an important thing to remember Anger is an invitation to slow down and ask ourselves, what's going on inside me right now? That this involuntary thing is coming out. And why, why anger is so scary? I, I would say anger is scarier than fear. Anger is so scary, not because it's always wrong. You should be angry when harm happens to things that you should love. You should be angry. But you and I, brothers and sisters, we love some stuff we should not love. And we love some stuff more than we should love it. And so when our anger comes out, it's an invitation to slow down and say, what's going on under the hood? Why am I so angry about this? Because even more dangerously, anger, more than any other emotion we experience, and man, do we see it in this story, anger leads to action. Anger makes us do stuff. That's not necessarily bad. In, 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 in classical Greek philosophy, the word for anger is, that's used is thumos. And thumos is a big deal in classic philosophy if you studied it in school. Because thumos is described as the fire in man's heart that burns and leads us to take heroic action. Like we, we realize our kingdom is being threatened and so we come out with the warriors to attack. Thumos is what drives us out of laziness and apathy to seize the day and to be bold. Thumos, anger, is what gets you there. It's the fire that gets lit underneath you so that you do something. We could also say that anger, then, is our defensive response to what we love being harmed. Anger is a reaction. But what if we love something we shouldn't? like I've already asked. What if we love something too much? What if we're defending something that really should not be defended like that? What, what, what does it say about us when we drop an atomic bomb on somebody when like a verbal warning would suffice? Why does anger so often for all of us make us come across way too much, way too strong? Why do we even come across some things as defensive at all because they shouldn't be defended? Why do we do that? I mentioned this morning in a quip as we were looking in Hebrews chapter 12 at at the danger of various sins that happen in the life of a Christian. And I pointed out something that was pointed out to me a while back. That, And and y'all know this. Of all the sins, of all the ways that we disobey and ignore God in the world, it seems like the Bible really hammers on two in particular. Uh, Y'all could probably guess that the Bible hammers on sexual immorality. And the Bible hammers on anger. Those two topics are just repeated a number of times as real dangerous. And why is that? And someone, I think the argument is right. It's not that anger and sexual immorality are like particularly offensive to God. I don't think that's the case. And it's not just because they are particularly dangerous to the people around us. Although they are, there are others that could make that list too. Anger and sexual immorality are dangerous because they uniquely hurt us. Sexual immorality and anger both get inside you and the roots go down deep. And they are hard to pull out. And the roots send out more roots. It's like an evil cancer that it gets in you and it spreads. And you pull out some of it and you realize it's spread somewhere else. Anger is one of the top two because it is so hard to kill and it is so deadly inside of our hearts. I mean, just look at the anger in the story. What does anger, the involuntary response, that defends what we love against harm. 
where do we see that in this story? Well, really clearly we see it in the people. The, God's people, delivered out of Egypt, saved out of slavery, they are angry. I mean, they're angry because they love their own bodies and they say they love their own cattle. Um, they don't have water. They're angry at the harm that's happening because we're thirsty in the middle of the wilderness. The, the, uh, verse 1, the wilderness of Zen is a desert. You need water. This is not an irrational thing. But the way that they ask it, um, I think it comes across as we read it, they could have asked a little, as we say in my house, can you ask a little more nicely? They could have used the magic word of please. They could have asked kindly. They could have asked respectfully. But instead, what do we see in verse 3? The request doesn't start with a question. It starts off by saying, I wish we were dead. And specifically, they're connecting this story to something that for the sake of time we've skipped. They're saying, we wish we had died when our brothers perished before the Lord. In number 16, talk about Moses and Aaron having to put out a fire. The leaders of Israel, kind of the lay leaders, 250 plus, gather together and they publicly reject God's leadership. And they reject Moses and Aaron as leaders. They say, we want to be the leaders. You're doing a pretty cruddy job. And so we're going to depose you in salvation with his people. They were right. We were wrong and we were stupid for sticking it out and trying to follow you guys. Not a great way to begin the ask, right? Not a great way to start a prayer. Why have you brought us out into this wilderness that we would die? Um, I think y'all understand the story well enough to know um, God did not bring them into the wilderness to die. He had promised them over and over and over again, and he had shown them literally on a daily basis that he would feed and water them, that he would care for them, that he would be with them in a way that God had never been with people since the Garden of Eden. That's not how they look at it. And then, it, it, it honestly, it, it gets, the anger leads them to be silly, doesn't it? Look at verse 5. They start r running off this list of things that they were expecting to find when they left Egypt. Like, we thought this was going to be the produce section. Like, there's no grain here. I want my pomegranates. <laughs> and there's no water to drink. But that's how the request kind of starts and closes. It's bookended like that. We want water. The people in Israel are not just complaining here. This, this is something that gets lost on us. Um, they are quarreling, and that word quarrel in Hebrew is important. They are, this is the word that's used so many times in the Old Testament. The, it's mostly used in the prophets, where God sends men and women to deliver a message because God has a quarrel with his people. It, 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 it very literally can be translated, bringing a lawsuit. God sends his prophets to bring a lawsuit against his people and to quarrel with them because they've broken his law. God's people here sue God for unfair treatment. I don't know if you follow Jesus this morning, but I think you probably have enough good sense to know that's not a great idea, to sue God. They bring this against him, and, and, and we as readers are supposed to remember the last time this happened. Back in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, the people sued God. They quarreled with him at another place that was also called Meribah, which means the lawsuit place or the quarreling place. They sued God there because they wanted water, and God gave them water there too. And here's something critical. Here's something we've got to understand if we want to understand the story in our own hearts. Way back here in Exodus 17, 40 years earlier, right after leaving Egypt, Back here, God addressed the problem by saying, by saying, hey, there's a rock right in front of you. Speak, well, excuse me. God says in, in Exodus 17, I'm going to manifest my presence. I'm going to stand on the rock. I want you to hit the rock with your staff. And when you do that, enough water will come out to give water to all these people. Hit the rock that I'm standing on and water will come out. Similar circumstances, 40 years earlier. God willingly, I mean, what's going on there? You know, God has no body, so he can't be hit with a stick. But you see what God is saying here? I'm going to take the blow. I'm going to stand there and let you strike me, symbolically. And out of the blow that I take, water will come forth and take care of all these people. He graciously provides for stubborn, 
ignorant, angry people. Look at the specific motivations here. God's people are angry. Would have been better to die as rebels. Y'all are bad leaders. Y'all lied to us about what we were going to experience out here. Y'all are so incompetent that we and everything we love is going to die. And what's implied? God made a really bad choice when he made you the Messiah. God messed up by appointing you as the little C Christ. The people are angry, but who else is angry in this story? It's Moses and it's Aaron. Moses, in verse 10, yells at the people for their real and true rebellion against God. He yells at them. And it's like he's, in verse 10, it's like he's doing a magic trick. You want to see water come out of a rock? It's emphasized that in, in Hebrew, it's almost like it's underlined. You want to see what I can do? You rebels? And Moses lashes out at the rock, not what God had told him to do. He tries to repeat the thing he did 40 years ago. He takes the stick and he strikes the rock where last time God was standing, symbolically. He strikes out, he lashes out, not just at the people, but at God, instead of speaking to it like he commanded. God had not said he would be standing on the rock like last time, but the people are not just the ones who are angry in this story. If anyone is in trouble for their anger, it's God's leader lashing out at God for the stuff he has to put up with. We've seen him complain like that before in Numbers, and now we're seeing it violently. His angry response shows exactly who he thinks he's attacking. Yeah, he's, he's attacking the people, but he's attacking God because in Moses' eyes, God is harming what he loves. Maybe it's his own sense of comfort. Maybe it's his own sense of feeling like a decent person. Like, I'm competent. I'm a decent leader. I can lead these people. And God, you put me in this set of circumstances. I feel like I can't do that. You're hurting me, God. These people are hurting me, and I am angry. Aaron's the same way, and Aaron gets the same punishment. Aaron's anger does not lead him to strike the rock. Aaron, maybe y'all experience this too, Aaron just stands off to the side. Aaron doesn't say a word this whole time. Even though God had said, hey, y'all speak to the rock. Aaron just shuts up and watches. If, you know, Moses has what we might call a hot anger. Aaron has a cold anger. Where do you find yourself? Moses and Aaron are so angry at the anger of the people. But you know who's most angry in this story? We, we see it based on his reaction. It's God. God is angry at what's going on, which is ironic because when the story starts, when the request comes out, God is exceedingly patient. It seems like he's willing to give these people everything they ask for, even though they ask for it in a most jerk-like fashion. <laughs> like, God is going to give water to these people. He's patient. He's kind. He's gracious. He is going to give these people what they want without any hint of discipline, but he manifests, he shows us his anger against Moses and Aaron. Who, what, what, why? What do they do? Verse 12, God's summary of what they did was, they did not uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. God loves his holiness. And Moses and Aaron attacked God's holiness. How, how do they, they do that? This is a complex thing. There's a whole bunch of books, a whole lot of studies that have been written about what exactly is going on in this story. But we can say this much at least. The people's actions, they did not hold up God as special, as set apart, as holy. But Moses and Aaron, his appointed leaders of his special people, they failed to recognize how special and how different God is. And so his anger is targeted and it is measured and it is painful toward his leaders. Because God... I don't know what you think about this, but I think it's, it's not even a difficult argument to make. In the whole Bible, the angriest character is God. We, we read about his wrath against sin and evil. And of, uh, we want to say, of course he would be, because if anger is a flip side of love, how could God be love, like we see so many times, and not be angry when what he loves is harmed? When, when God sees evil and injustice done in the world, when, when God experiences the petty little insults and the disobediences we show him all the time, if he so loves us and we are destroying ourselves and his world through our disobedience and our ignorance of him, how could God not be angry? 
if he loves us so much, you can't have one without the other. And if his holiness is his plan, as he shows us so many times, to bring all kinds of people from all over the world into knowing him, if, if God has so shown himself to be so different and special, real pragmatically, you can't get what God has to give anywhere else. If, if, if God wants to show himself as so unique and so special for the hope that other people would come in to explore him, to, to grasp at him, to figure out what this God is like because he's clearly different, I know that much. If his own people treat God like you could get him at the dollar store, God is dime a dozen when we treat him like this. When we attack God's holiness like that, how could he not be angry? Because God's holiness is his means to save the world. That is his plan to bless bad people like us. And when his own leaders, who are especially chosen to protect his name and to make his name known in the eyes of all people, when that gets trashed like Moses and Aaron do, anger is the perfectly appropriate response. It's perfectly appropriate. The point in this is very simple. There's anger everywhere in this story. It is everywhere in every character. God's anger is centered on the harm that's done to others through unbelief, through disobedience. But everybody else's anger, even Moses's and even Aaron's anger, is coming from a self-centered, impatient love of self. Anger is not always sinful. God shows us that here. But it is, so, it is so dangerous, a weapon in the hands of people like us. It's putting an AR-15 in the hands of a three-year-old. It can do what you need it to do, and it's appropriate. But it can do so much harm. What, what's, what stories are coming up in your mind, in your own life? What has anger done in your life? What have, what have you done in anger that hurt other people? What has been done to you out of other people's anger? I don't, I don't need to illustrate this point. In your own lives, we are all filled with stories of inappropriate, sinful anger doing evil in God's world. And that's the second thing we need to see. Not only is anger dangerous because it easily leads to sin, it is dangerous because it seems like it is unstoppable. Anger easily leads to sin, and anger feels impossible to check. You and I could talk and teach this till we're blue in the face. Anger is bad. Anger hurts. Anger is, is almost always inappropriate. The way that we deal with it, we could know that so perfectly well, walk out the door and be the angriest people in the world. Knowing is half the battle. The theologians of G.I. Joe were right. But knowing does not finish the battle because anger, even when we know it's wrong, it just comes out. One of the hardest things in the world, I, I experience this in pastoral ministry all the time. Let me encourage you with this. I think the hardest thing in the world, humanly speaking, is for someone to sin against you and you not sin back. I, th I think that is the, what trips up us as people all the time. It's easy to sin against people. It's easy to be sinned against. It's real hard to not sin back. Because we love ourselves so much. And when what we love is harmed, whatever it looks like for you, hot anger like Moses, cool, cold anger like Aaron, we get angry. Moses and Aaron prove it so well. I don't know if you caught this, but this is an important note in the story, is how it starts off. Verse 1 is critical. It's tied together. This story kicks off. One, we see the, the people of Israel move to a different location. And this almost, the small little detail we almost lose. Aaron, Moses and Aaron's sister dies. Miriam, who, like I said earlier, was a chief leader of God's people. She, it wasn't just like she led the women's ministry. She was a leader of God's people. She died. She died. We don't see it happening as a discipline of some kind. She, she just died, and they buried her. And we cannot, we cannot let ourselves miss out on that in the background because Moses and Aaron's anger comes out of a season of them grieving. Not just the loss of their sister, but someone who had stood shoulder to shoulder with him, usually. There's a notable exception where Miriam did not stand shoulder to shoulder. But for the most part, Miriam had been an ally. 
And when you're feeling like the people of Israel, a million people are breathing down your necks and God has put you in an impossible situation, you want all the allies you can get. And when one of them dies, who would not be brought low? Note also a story we skipped, Numbers chapter 12. Moses is described as literally the most humble person on the planet. Moses is better than anyone else in the world at this time at thinking about other people's as better than himself and thinking about their needs as more important than his own. Nobody is better at considering other people like that. It's, it's hard to imagine anybody else in our world today putting up with this kind of behavior for so many years. Who could do it? But this is the point of the story. Even Moses, the most humble guy in the world. We have seen him in numbers show his red neck, as my people say. We have seen him act out. But who among us would not, dealing with this stuff year after year? Even Moses, maybe one of the greatest people who's ever lived, even he loses his temper, not just in general, but he, how can we relate to this? He loses his temper at the worst possible moment when it would do the most damage, just like we do. And even though Miriam has died, and even though the people are clearly disrespectful, those are factors in God's eyes, but they are not excuses. You know, th this story is actually mentioned later in the Psalms. God's people, hundreds of years later, are reflecting back on this story. And in Psalm 106, it's kind of as, as a part of a prayer and a part of a song that we would sing together, we're kind of telling our family history. And here's God's inspired commentary. Here's what God sees in the story. They, the people, angered him, Moses. They angered him at the waters of Meribah. And it went ill with Moses on their account. For they made his spirit bitter. And he spoke rashly with his lips. Nobody made Moses say or do anything. He, he was the one who chose to speak rashly. But the circumstances were real. <laughs> the factors were powerful. And ironically, Moses calls these people's rebels. This is a unique word in Hebrew. It's, this is the first time it's used in the Bible. Moses calls these people's rebels, which they show sure enough are. But who in this story disobeys the most direct order? Who, 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 who rebels against the clearest word from God? It's he himself. And we can totally understand how Moses and Aaron got to this point, right? Their, their anger has transformed, though, into something else. It's, it's been locked up tight and buried in the ground and left to rot for 40 years. And all that fermenting that's happened has turned their anger into bitterness. Y'all, we cannot bottle up our anger forever. I, I used to tell people all the time, I'm not an angry person. It's just every six months or so, I just want to punch a hole in the wall. But I'm not angry. I really, and maybe you, I really thought that I could just contain it. That I could hold it in and I could just let it go. And everything would be okay. It, it just cannot work like that. I don't know if that's what Moses and Aaron did. But as it, it's been rightly been said, what happens here is such a good picture of bitterness. And bitterness is drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. We do that in our anger that we bottle up. So let me ask again, what are you angry about? What, what do you love that is being harmed or has been harmed? What are you stewing on? Even as I'm talking this morning, what are you, what are you mulling over? What are you bottling up inside? Who, who are you trying to kill by drinking a bottle of poison? The, the danger is not just illustrated by Moses and Aaron. It, this danger of anger and bitterness is, is taught so clearly by our Lord Jesus, who was a greater prophet than Moses, and he was a greater priest than Aaron. You remember his words. Y'all have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. 
Moses and Aaron miss out on a promised land. They, they, they would only see it from afar. Both of them would be allowed to go up on top of a, a, a high mountain and look across the Jordan River and see it, but they would never go in despite 40 plus years of faithful service to God. They would lose out on that because of one explosive episode. God has told us in Scripture that there is a, a much greater promised land, a, a better place that's more flowing with milk and honey, where his presence is more clearly seen, where peace actually comes and stays, where people love each other and love him better and better, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. This new world to come, God is bringing to this world to bless forgiven sinners. And he's told us that there is a much greater death, a much greater loss, a, a, a hell of, of suffering and sadness and pain and loneliness. The new heavens and earth will be everything Canaan represented and symbolized. Death on this side of the river is something fearful. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And anger will motivate you toward one or the other. What you are stewing over and mulling over, what, what you, your response is to the harm of what you love will drive you and me to one or the other. But how do you check that, even if you know it's true? How, how can you change what you love? How can you pull the throttle back when everything inside of you involuntarily wants to shove it all the way up to sixth gear? Maybe seventh and eighth if we can find one of those. How, how can we check that? How can anybody beat sinful anger if even Moses disqualifies himself? I have good news. There's such good news, y'all. The Bible shows us the answer. If even the best of us cannot do it on our own, then we must need somebody who is not like us, who is better than us to do it for us. Because you, when, you, when you play the tape of your own life and when you play the tape of the greatest people who to ever live, and when you see, like I do, that my heart is too deformed, my loves and passions are too disordered, our circumstances in the wilderness of our lives are too trying, we need a better Redeemer. We need a better Messiah, a, a better Christ. And as our better Messiah and our better Christ, Jesus Christ knows exactly what it's like to be angry. Remember what we saw earlier in the Old Testament. The God who shows himself in the Old Testament is the angriest character in the Old Testament because of his great love. Jesus is the angriest person in the New Testament that he expresses in his love. It drives him not, not in this life to crush and to destroy and to annihilate, but to save. Anger is the drive that comes out of Jesus' love that leads to him not disobeying, but obeying. And he is our only hope to enter that better promised land. We remember in Lent the story of Christ in the beginning of his ministry being tempted and tried in the desert. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, talk about a factor. Talk about something that explains how low he was. What a great summary from Matthew. He was hungry. The tempter, the devil, came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Do you not feel your, your, your fists clench a little bit when the devil talks to the Lord like that? The greatest, the most gentle, the most patient, the kindest man to ever live. That he would experience that kind of disrespect, that kind of temptation. The threat to God's name, the, the, the implication that God doesn't really love you because he's not going to feed you. The, the dishonor shown to Jesus' father. How does Jesus respond in anger to harm being done to the name of his father? You know what he says. He answers back, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. 
but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus' anger leads to obedience, not disobedience. On the night that he knew he would be betrayed and arrested on the way to being murdered, Jesus prays for the people who were going to leave him high and dry, his so-called best friends, his disciples, moments before he was to be arrested. At the same time as his best friends fell asleep when they were supposed to be praying with him, he prays that the Father would not abandon them like they were abandoning him. That they would live forever in the new heavens and earth. And on the cross, in not just physical but spiritual agony, our Lord looks at people who are revolting against God, against his kindness and his gentleness and his own patience, who were torturing him, who were putting him in anguish, who were angering him at the harm they were doing. In his anger, the Lord prays, Father, Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Moses struck the rock where he thought God was standing. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock where God's presence is manifested in the world, where water comes out to quench our thirst, not just for our bodies, but for our souls. Even if the blow that struck it was angry and sinfully delivered, Water comes out where losers and ingrates like us have our thirst quenched by some water that flows abundantly. We should empathize with Moses, but we have to worship Jesus. Because this Jesus is everything Moses wanted to be. But he couldn't. He doesn't just lead God's people through the wilderness. He provides what we need along the way, and he actually brings us across the river. He brings us in. He doesn't just see it from far away, but he is sitting enthroned in the capital city. And it is a land that flows with milk and honey because he's in it. Jesus is not whipping you and me from behind with a whip to shape us up. He's not calling us names. He's not nursing bitterness against you in his heart. He is welcoming you home. And he's holding your hand and walking you on the path that he paved himself. He's taking you to a place that he's earned for you. So as as the band comes up, let me invite you and me to taste the grace of God. To taste water that has flown from a kind Messiah, a real Savior. He says to his disciples, and what better way to invite us to the table, let anyone who's thirsty come to me. And let the one who believes in me drink. So this morning, if you are physically and you are emotionally and you are spiritually worn down from your own anger and the, the, the fist has been clenched for so long and you cannot pry it open yourself from defending what you love, your own reputation, your own body, your own sense of comfort in this world, from anger down against people who deserve for you to love them, If your anger has worn you down and you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, tired of wandering in the wilderness of an angry life, take Jesus at his word to unclench the fist, to drain the bitterness, to change you. And if you have trusted Jesus and you've taken him at his word, this table's for you. And if that's not you yet, then you're welcome here. We're so glad you're here. Please feel free to stay in your seats. There's there's no pressure to do this. But for those of us who have trusted Jesus and in trusting him, seen him change our lives, brothers and sisters, this table is for you. So brothers and sisters, while the song is being played, let's take the elements and return to our seats. Brothers and sisters, come to the table.